final talk of the session, um, this, uh, Dr. Co uh, Josh Compton is Associate Professor in the Institute of Writing and Rhetoric at Dartmouth College. His research specialty is inoculation theory, theory of resistance to influence that mirrors processes of biological inoculation. Just as exposure to a weak version of a virus can lead to resistance to stronger viruses later, exposure to a weak version of an argument can lead to, strong, to resistance to stronger arguments later. He applies this theory to a range of uh, issues and contexts, including gun control, marijuana legalization, late night television, political humor, fears of public speaking, <coughs> most uh, recently sport exercise and physical activity. Uh, Dr. Compton will discuss if inoculation theory can be used to increase resistance to misinformation. He's going to save us all. That's, that's what I'm, he's here for. Uh, please welcome Dr. Compton to the podium. Eric, that was such a nicer introduction than my mom gives me. <laughs> she always introduces me as her son, the doctor, who specializes in inoculation. <laughs> Quickly followed by, but not a real doctor, <laughs> and not real inoculation. <laughs> so, my mom's wrong. <laughs> I can't wait to tell her about your talk last night, Dan. She's wrong about many things, including because PhDs are neat, <laughs> and inoculation theory uh, uh, is important, and it is consequential, and it's, it's made a difference across, across contexts. Um, it was introduced in the early 1960s by a social psychologist named William McGuire, and a, a big part of his motivation for introducing this theory was to counterbalance uh, what he saw as this uh, lopsided focus of per persuasion. A lot of the persuasion theory was looking at how to make a message more persuasive, so how do you design a better persuasive message? And um, he realized that very few people were looking at how do you confer resistance to all of these persuasion messages. And at least part of his motivation was something that he found quite curious and concerning at the end of the Korean War. And that's when a number of, um, a handful of American soldiers elected to remain with their previous um, uh, captors when they were given the chance to return back to the States. And he wondered how that, how that could have happened. Uh, how could a, a, a soldier go from being a prisoner of war to someone who elected to want to stay? And he uh, set out to create what he called a, a vaccine for brainwashing. So is there a way that you can prepare one's mind prior to encountering persuasive efforts so that they can resist those persuasive efforts later? So I've been studying this theory for uh, almost 20 years now, and the first 10 years of my research program looked at inoculation in some pretty conventional contexts, uh, including politics and health and marketing. So with my political work, I looked at whether or not politicians could inoculate against attacks launched by their competitors or attacks launched in editorials. And then I thought it would be fun uh, to see if politicians could inoculate against late night comedy. And, um, the, the answer is no, actually, to, to both of those things. It, it was not fun <laughs> at all to study that, uh, and they couldn't. Um, a lot of us realize that um, when you study humor, it stops being funny, and um, it kind of ruined uh, uh, late night political comedy for me uh, since then. Uh, this is a little aside, but not only could politicians not inoculate, against uh, late night political humor, but they were actually worse off when they, when they, when they tried. There was a boomerang effect. Um, I should also put a little asterisk here and say, I'm talking about a kind of old late night political comedy. This is in the early 2000s, so I was studying um, a comedians like Jay Leno and David Letterman. Um, and students, you may have read about these individuals in your history books, but they used to be funny <laughs> to people like me. Um, in my health work, uh, I've looked mainly at issues facing college students. And um, for instance, we did a study to see if you could inoculate college students against temptations to engage in binge drinking and unprotected sex. And the answer was yes to both of those. And what was particularly interesting about that study was we didn't even mention binge drinking in the inoculation study. We just tried to inoculate against their attitudes about un uh, unprotected sex, and it had a transfer effect. 
to binge drinking attitudes too. So it seems to be tapping into this umbrella of risky behaviors. And then my marketing study also looked at college students. Can you inoculate college students against predatory credit card marketing? So um, at least when I was in school back in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s, um, that was, uh, there was a big effort for credit card companies to come on campus and, and get college freshmen. Maybe this still happens, I'm not sure. But the research showed that that's when their attitudes were very valuable, when they were wanting to assert their in independence, when the uh, issues of status were high. And so uh, credit card companies were signing up a lot of people, and a lot of people weren't able to pay those, pay those credit card bills. And so we went in to see if you could inoculate prior to that. And you could. But more recently, my research has shifted from the, uncon from the conventional areas to the unconventional areas. This is one of my most recent studies uh, with my colleagues at the University of Western Australia in uh, Perth. Uh, and in this study, we checked to see if you could inoculate against public speaking anxiety. Uh, specifically, we were looking at college students giving class speeches. Now, as a stutterer with a high degree of social anxiety to begin with. This issue resonated with one of the researchers as well, the number two guy up there, <laughs> the number one guy here. Uh, and the good news was, yes, we were able to inoculate against public speaking anxiety in our college students prior to presentations. And it, it was uh, relatively simple. It was a, a one-page information sheet uh, that was able to help prepare them for these challenges before they faced them themselves. Here's the really cool part. Not only did it lower their global amount of public speaking anxiety, but what anxiety was remaining, because you don't want to get rid of all of it. There needs to be some anxiety there to, to suggest your enthusiasm in your audience and in your topic. The anxiety that was remaining, they were able to reframe as something positive, as opposed to something that would be more detrimental. So a good deal of this work then uses uh, experimental quantitative methods where we're uh, adding a numerical value to attitudes, much like the research that we've seen so far today. So we end up working with uh, 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 results like this. And I'm just going to point out a couple of things because they're going to be pertinent to what I'm going to talk about coming up pretty soon. I'm actually going to do an, uh, an abrupt shift from quantitative to rhetorical analysis. Because I'm so glad that you invited someone that you thought was just a social scientist who actually is a rhetorical analysis in disguise. <laughs> so I'm going to take full advantage of this. And I'm the last speaker, so he can't kick me out uh, as a result of that. Um, I wanted to point out that the first condition is the inoculation condition, control condition there. It didn't receive any sort of, sort of message. Uh, this was given to the college students a couple of weeks before their speech, and then was given to them, uh, the inoculation message was given to them right before their speech, too. And then right after their speech, we we uh, 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 measure these different variables. We're going to come back to the construct of threat, because that's really important in inoculation. Um, but I wanted to point out that across the board, almost without fail, there's either a lower level of anxiety in those who were inoculated, or a reframing of the anxiety towards something uh, healthier and more productive. Uh, here's an earlier study um, that I did with my advisor and mentor, Michael Fowle who was uh, the leading expert in uh, contemporary inoculation theory. Uh, I only show you this study because um, we're not only trying to figure out the effects of these messages, but also how we get to the resistance part too. So we use something called structural equation modeling. I, I'm, uh, there's two reasons I'm not going to go into this, to this model when I don't understand all of this model myself. Um, and number two, it isn't pertinent to what I'm going to be, to be talking about. I show it to you only to show that we're not just interested in if you inoculate later are they resistant to persuasive attack messages. We're also measuring the implicit variables that take us from the inoculation treatment message all the way to resistance. We're trying to figure out how this actually works. Here's where we shift to rhetorical analysis, because over the last few years, um, I still love working with experiments like this, but I've, I've, I've kind of missed texts. I've missed words. <laughs> and so I've been looking for inoculation messages outside of the laboratory and to see them in uh, uh, real-life circumstances. And I thought it would be neat to see, can I go way beyond when McGuire first formalized this theory in the early 1960s to find some instances of inoculation in use before it was called inoculation? And sure you can. Inoculation's everywhere. And this one's particularly apt 
Oh, one editor recently criticized me for the piece that I wrote on this and said that I was trying to be cute. Um, but cute can be right. And here's one instance in which there's cute analysis that was actually right too. This is the Reverend William Cooper, uh, who was a minister in colonial Boston uh, uh, during the second resurgence of the smallpox um, uh, epidemic. And uh, uh, he was really struggling because there were members of his congregation who were dying from smallpox um, because they weren't getting vaccinated. They were re re refusing the vaccinations. And what, what made it all more difficult for him is that they were refusing the vaccination based on religious reasons. Um, that, that there was this idea that by taking the vaccination, you were um, playing God, that you were working with um, evil, uh, as opposed to just trying to remain uh, healthy. I'll come back to him in just a second. Here's another example. Uh, this is William Osler, uh, a, a ph physician. Uh, he was also a strong proponent of uh, actual medical inoculations. He also, uh, in his rhetoric and his, his, in his, his addresses, used inoculation strategies to try to attack the uh, anti-vaxxers. Uh, he also added a layer of humor to it, by the way. Uh, uh, he, he, he was re a really kind man. I don't, don't know if you've ever read, read the work of, 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 of Osler. A really kind man, very, very, very genial. Uh, sweet guy who basically told the anti-vaxxers that he wanted them to die, <laughs> but, but he put it in a joke, so it was all right and everybody laughed, <laughs> thankfully. Here's a contemporary example too. Brian, one of your slides reminded me of this here, this myth fact um, um, a format. And we can come back to this, why, why I think that this is an inoculation message and not necessarily a great persuasive message, right? Because there's a difference between the two. Um, in which it's an inoculation attempt to prepare you for your aunts and uncles uh, sitting around the Thanksgiving table <laughs> who are going to be mashing, this is Obamacare, a, a few years ago. And so to prepare you for some responses to that. And the last example that I'll show, we're going to come back to all this so we can see how inoculation is actually working here. But um, this is an editorial that was in Politico uh, a little over a year ago uh, that Ted Cruz wrote in support of uh, uh, Jeff Sessions when he was up for Attorney General. Um, oh, there's one more example that I forgot I was going to show you. Spinoza. <laughs> you were waiting for when he was going to show up, weren't you, Eric? <laughs> yeah. So uh, what I found interesting as I started to read the work of Spinoza was that he too used inoculation rhetoric uh, in, in, in his work. And so I'm going to point out some examples of that. So yes, in just a moment we're going to be comparing the rhetorical prowess of Spinoza and Ted Cruz. <laughs> Place your bets. <laughs> so it's probably way past time I should define what I mean by inoculation theory. I forgot that that, that wasn't going to be part of my introduction, and I was grateful for it, uh, Eric. Um, the idea of, uh, uh, of inoculation, and one of the reasons I love this theory so much, is that its name defines itself. Um, as Michael and I uh, summarized it a few years ago, individuals can be inoculated against future attitude attacks much the same way that individuals can be inoculated against future viral attacks. The way McGuire put it, in the biological situation, the person is typically made resistant to some attacking virus by pre-exposure to a weakened dose of the virus. And that's basically how the conventional prophylactic flu vaccine works, right? I mean, we get the flu shot. It's a weakened version of the flu virus. We don't get sick because it has been weakened, but it's strong enough to motivate some sort of resistance process to it. And so later, when we encounter the stronger flu virus later, we're ready and we're less likely to get, to get sick. And that seems to be what's happening in persuasion, too. If you can give a weakened dose of the virus, in this case a weakened dose of the persuasion, of the influence, of the counter-argument, prior to encountering stronger versions of that argument, of that influence, you're more likely to be able to resist it. And the way that we conventionally weaken the persuasion is through the two-sided message format, building on the work in the 1940s and 50s of Hovland and Janus and other propaganda researchers. Uh, by the way, their research, one of their findings that uh, um, um, uh, I, always, I always like to go back to, 1958 study, which they were comparing two-sided messages with one-sided message. Two-sided message meaning that you give reasons for and against what you're advocating. One-sided message meaning you're just giving reasons for it. Um, and they got to the end of this study and they were wanting to see which was more persuasive, and the answer was neither. They were both equally persuasive in that particular context. And if they would have ended there, we would never know about the study, probably. It probably would have never been published. But they then came back two weeks later to attack that, that position. 
and only the position that was supported by the two-sided message was able to withstand that, that stronger challenge later. The position that was supported by the one-sided message, which looked just as strong as the two-sided message so, so support, um, actually crumbled. And, 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 then, and that does, that's been called many different names. One of the names is uh, uh, the Picker Tiger effect. Right? So the position looked really strong, but it only looked strong. It hadn't been challenged yet. And when it was challenged, it crumbled. So McGuire built off of this research to develop inoculation theory. Uh, and the way that I've summarized this work is refutational pretreatments raise persuasive challenges, counterarguments, or arguments that challenge existing positions, beliefs, or attitudes. These counterarguments are then weakened by refutations. So we're talking about two constructs here in these inoculation messages. We're raising some counterarguments, and then we're refuting them uh, prior to encountering stronger versions. Now, you may have noticed that I said two really important conditions here. It's a pre-existing attitude, value, belief that you're inoculating. You can't be healed from the flu if you already have the flu. In fact, that's one of the questions that you're asked before you get the flu shot, right? So inoculation in the conventional prophylactic sense is a preemptive treatment. The right position is in place first, and then we inoculate it. We introduce weakened versions of these, of these arguments, weakened by refutations. So let's go back to uh, uh, William Cooper's brochure here, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll show you how I think he used inoculation. I may have to step a bit, because this is hard enough to read uh, when you're up, up, up close to it. Uh, uh, in this pamphlet, uh, I, I, again, he's trying to bring up arguments against vaccination and then refuting them. Uh, he says, one great thing urged against this practice is that it is not lawful for me uh, to, take myself, to make myself sick when I am well or voluntarily to bring a distemper upon myself. We might call it a myth, right? Followed by the fact, or the answer. To bring sickness upon oneself for its own sake is what no man in his right wits would do, but to make myself sick in such a way as may probably serve my health and save my life, and with such a design is certainly fitting and reasonable, and therefore lawful. It's his entire pamphlet is bringing up these attacks against smallpox vaccination and then refuting them. And then you can see the same thing going on here with that preparation message to warn you about the arguments that your relatives were going to bring up about Obamacare before you went home for Thanksgiving. Here's an example from an actual study that we did. Um, this was when we were looking at um, uh, legalizing marijuana in this study. Now, um, I want to point out here that uh, we designed inoculation messages, no matter where you were on the spectrum here of legalizing marijuana. If you were for it, we inoculated that. We kept you for it. If you were against it, we inoculated that. We kept you against it. And we also used four other issues here too. Legalizing hand, uh, or banning handguns, legalizing gambling, restricting TV violence and one other issue in which we had about equal for and against in our, in our population there. Uh, Counter-argument, right? And then followed by the reputation. So that first part then was the virus that we weakened that then triggered the resistance response. So the mere presence of these unexpected challenges to the existing position, the mere presence of these counter-arguments threatens the perceived security of that existing position. In other words, when you read one of these counter-arguments, just reading it, is enough to generate some sense of vulnerability, some sense, some sense of concern. You're then, you're, you're then motivated to give some more thought about that, that issue. And, and that's what we call threat in inoculation. This idea that I have the right position and I feel pretty good about it, but here's a counter argument that I haven't really thought much about. Or here's a counter argument that I have thought about but I'm not quite sure how to refute it. Or here's a counter argument, what if there are other counter arguments? That part's really important because the what if there's other kind of arguments motivates more thinking about your, your position. And that's why inoculation doesn't just protect against the counter arguments that you bring up in that message. It protects against theoretically any counter argument that's raised against that position. So if I'm trying to inoculate a group of sixth graders against smoking, and I say your, your friends are gonna tell you smoking makes you cool, but it doesn't make you cool. It makes you have to you know, hide behind the slide on the playground when you're smoking, 
which actually does sound kind of cool. <laughs> so, a bad reputation. All right, so, so some other reason. Uh, that would then protect you against other peer pressure arguments that weren't even raised in the inoculation treatment message. So it's actually better than a flu shot. Mom, it is real inoculation, right? Because inoculating against some counter arguments protects against any. It'd be like a flu shot that protects you against the measles, too. Uh, so that's threat. Um, the other way that we try to generate threat in many inoculation messages is uh, what's called a forewarning of persuasive attacks or an e explicit forewarning. Uh, for example, uh, Here's the one we used in that research I was talking about earlier. We warn them that some of their arguments are very persuasive and they might cause you to rethink your position on this, on this issue. So, in other words, the first thing you would read in an inoculation treatment message is, you have the right position, but there are other arguments out there that run counter to that that are so strong they might make you change your mind. And sometimes we give stats in these messages that say, in fact, 60% of all people end up changing their mind about this issue over their first year that they're in college or whatever. So the key is that this is threatening enough to be defense stimulating, as McGuire puts it, but not so strong as to overwhelm. We don't want to make the people sick. I don't want to go into this predatory credit card marketing study and make college freshmen more likely to uh, apply for multiple credit cards. Right? I don't want to promote bench drinking. Um, uh, 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 any of these studies, we're, we're just trying to threaten enough without overwhelming their defenses, without boomeranging. I want the flu virus to be weak enough that it makes me resistant to flu, not to get sick. And we can see this too, uh, uh, coming back to uh, uh, William, William Cooper's work. Uh, he used this forewarning in his pamphlet. I perceive that the scruples and, ob and objections commonly offered by people here have such a force upon your mind as keeps you from going into this method, which may, by the blessing of heaven, be your safety and preservation. Now friendship, the offices of which should be sacredly regarded by us, obliges me to attempt to relieve and help you in a matter wherein your life, so precious in itself and deservedly dear to me, is so much concerned. That's a beautiful, eloquent forewarning, right? It's so much nicer than ours. <laughs> there are persuasive arguments out there that might make you change your mind. <laughs> Next, this is a little better, but it's doing the same thing. Same with this one, right? We're, 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 we're being forewarned here in this second uh, box. At Thanksgiving this year, the healthcare law is bound to come up at the dinner table. And uh, the sponsor of this message wants you to be prepared with the facts. That's a forewarning. And Ted Cruz uses one too. Uh, Ted Cruz says, over the next several days, you will see numerous vile efforts to smear Senator Sessions' good name. And then there's more. I don't, I don't want to read it. <laughs> so, but basically, it's, uh, he's, he's warning you about the arguments that are going to be brought up against Sessions. Uh, and then going right into, as we talked about earlier, a counter-argument and a reputation. So let's come back to inoculation. Something dynamic happens after you read one of these messages. Forewarning, counter-argument, reputation. Usually we bring up two or three counter-arguments and review each one. Those inoculated begin to counter-argue on their own. So we empirically measure what happens after you read an inoculation treatment message, and it causes you to think more thoughts about the issue. It causes you to bring up additional counter-arguments and additional refutations of those counter-arguments, too. So inoculation messages make you think more about the issue. And that's why we get all of this, right? That you're not just going from inoculation to, to resistance. You're experiencing inoculation, which is generating threat. And again, that just means vulnerability. Like, oh no, this position that I hold, that I, that I, that I value, uh, might not be safe. And so I start to think more about it. We have counter-arguing going on during the interim. Usually we're measuring this within two weeks of each other. So inoculation treatment message, two weeks later, you're attacked. All of these other variables are, variables are dynamically working together to create this resistance. And Spinoza uses it too, uh, even in his writing. So independent of whether or not you see overlap here, and I do, which we'll get to in my last slide, uh, he uses it as a rhetorical device in some of his writings. Uh, here's an example. Here's a forewarning. Here, I doubt not, readers will come to a stand and will call to mind many things which will cause them to hesitate. I therefore beg them to accompany me slowly, step by step, and not to pronounce on my statement till they have read to the end. It's a forewarning. They're warning against quick judgment. So withhold judgment, give me some time. When you start to be challenged, in this case by yourself, by your own thoughts, by your interpersonal communication, wait. 
wait until I get to the end. Here's another forewarning. If you will reflect a little on this, you will, I doubt not, easily be able to reply to any objections which may be urged against my opinion, as many of my friends have already done. And then we get them, counter-arguments and refutations. Other objections might also be raised, but as I am not bound to put in evidence everything that anyone may dream, I will only set myself to the task of refuting those I have mentioned, and that as briefly as possible. And then counter-argument, and then refutation. Giving a small dose of the virus, Here's the argument that runs counter to what I'm arguing, and here's why that's wrong. Which, according to inoculation theory, then triggers additional thinking about the issue and a strengthening of the belief. This one isn't a perfect fit, but I just couldn't resist including it as a slide. Uh, you're writing this letter, and it says the book uh, which the professor wrote against mine, and which was published after his death, I saw lying in a bookseller's window. From the little I then read of it, I judged it unworthy of perusal, still less of reply. I therefore left the book and its author. With an inward smile, I reflected that the most ignorant are ever the most audacious and the most ready to rush into print. <laughs> That's perfect. And it is an occupation, actually. It's just not conventional. It's not counter-argument reputation. It's an attack against the source of that, of that message. It's still weakening the virus. Right? Just not with the uh, actual uh, conventional refutation format. It's actually very close to that example that I gave earlier about William Osler, uh, the person who was a proponent of medical inoculation and used humor to make that point. Here's where I think there's a connection. Um, I'm eager to hear if you agree. Um, if uh, the rejection of an idea comes only when motivation and resources are provided, then I think inoculation theory actually provides both of those things, the motivation and the resources. Uh, research shows, in fact, a recent study just from last year shows that when you're threatened, when you have a position that you hold dear, that you value, that you want to keep, and you recognize vulnerability of that, you, you get to work. Uh, you're either scared of the idea that you're not going to be able to uh, stand up to that criticism, um, or you're uh, uh, motivated to shore up those defenses, to preempt them. And you get to work thinking about the issue much more deeply, researching the issue, reading the issue. In fact, we've recently discovered just in the last five years that when you read an inoculation message, it makes you want to talk to people about the issue. That those who read this two-sided message format, preceded by a forewarning, are more likely to talk to their friends and family about the issue. And they have two motivations for, for doing so. One is uh, proselytization, right? They, 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 they now feel like they have more information about this issue, so they want to spread it to others. They want to advocate for it. And the other is for reassurance. I just read a message that raised some counterarguments against this position, uh, either the way I feel about myself or the way I feel about this issue. Uh, and I need my friends now. I need to talk to them about it to see if they've also thought about these things too. Uh, um, published study that we're just working through the data right now suggests that we're doing this face to face after inoculation treatment messages. We're doing it via email, uh, social media, even the telephone is still being used uh, to get this uh, reassurance. Um, incidentally, the more you talk to your friends and family about it, the stronger your resistance is to attack messages later. So it's not just a product of resistance, it's actually a process of resistance too. Um, and footnote, and then I'll get to the very last, last point. Um, that reassures me that after inoculation messages, our instinct is to talk, is to engage in dialogue with one another. Because a lot of people ask me, what if inoculation falls into, into the wrong hands? Well, it does all the time. It has all the time. You know, this is the method uh, a, lot of, a lot of cults use to warn new cult members about what their friends and family are going to tell them to bring them out of it, right? It's used uh, by uh, de defense counsels and prosecutors, right? Where the stakes are high. So the issue isn't whether or not this is gonna fall into their own hands, it's what are the checks and balances here? And the fact that this encourages dialogue seems like a really good check to me, that it causes you to go out to your friends and family and talk about the issue to get different perspectives. And 
part that I withheld, not just your friends and family. It also makes you more likely to talk to people with opposing viewpoints on those issues too. Because now you feel more confident, you have higher self-esteem, and you know more information about it. You think you know what they're going to say, because I've warned you about some of those messages. But maybe that's wrong. Maybe they bring up a, a, a new argument. What I'm trying to get at is that dialogue is going to make, hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm not saving the day here, Eric, but hopefully it's going to make the truth much more likely to rise to the top. Um, here's that uh, message that we did about, about handguns, just, just quickly. Um, uh, there's the forewarning. That's the motivation to think more about the issue and to process the rest of this message. And it gives you the resources. Inoculation messages show you this is what counter-arguing looks like. This is what dialogue looks like. Here are some oppositional arguments. Here are some refutations here. Um, think of your own, right? There are, are, are some other arguments to think about, too. Um, so there's some examples of some resources that I think that inoculation theory offers. There's so much more to resistance than what's up here. This is, a, for one thing, this study is about 15 years, years old, and we've tested some other variables, too, a lot of affect emotions as well. It doesn't even include dialogue, the, what we call pitch or post-inoculation talk. So there's a lot more to discover about, uh, about inoculation. Um, I'll leave you with this. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Nearly all of the inoculation research in 50 years has looked at inoculation as a prophylactic treatment, a preventative treatment. You know, we're, uh, again, we're, we're, we're giving these messages to people who have the right attitude already in place and then protecting that. But there's been some very recent research to suggest that inoculation also might function as what's called therapeutic inoculation too, that it can change a position toward what the red tour is ad advocating and then immediately protect that position against future change, too. Um, so we'll see where uh, that research ends up going. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, especially for uh, that finishing sentence. Uh, and I totally agree with you that the dialogue is very important. Um, I think you just basically answered the question that uh, I had, but uh, I was wondering the whole time, because you said earlier that uh, the right belief were, needs to be placed already. But given what, uh, what Brian presented earlier, I was wondering whether that's really necessary, or whether it couldn't also work when you have the wrong belief or when you have no belief at all, like for example this uh, example that Brian used, I had no prior beliefs about it, uh, <laughs> but I found the refutation text very convincing and this alone might be enough for the inoculation. So essentially my question is, do you really think the motivation is necessary or are the resources enough for uh, people to be inoculated against later misinformation? I think that's a great question, and my first response is, yeah, that is what I was trying to get at there toward the end, was that some of the most recent findings suggest that it can have a therapeutic value, too. A lot of the work there is being done by uh, climate uh, change science communication research, um, um, who's, who's trying to give you the right information and also then protect it once you know how to, how to, how to recognize that. Uh, but in answer to your second question about motivation plus resources, in an inoculation message, you can't really have one without the other because by getting the resources, by getting the counter arguments, you are implicitly generating threat because you're saying here are some count, here are some uh, attacks that you could face, and that's motivating whether we explicitly forewarn or not. Just the mere presence of that. If I source derogate who's coming up to attack their position, that's motivating too. So it's really hard to give the resources in an inoculation message without giving the motivation. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, the analogy between actual inoculation against, say, you know, a, a disease or something, and this is really interesting. But I'm wondering if there's one area that just seems to break down. When I advise the students on writing papers, I always say, when you make sure to entertain counter arguments yeah. and, and entertain the 
strongest possible counter argument so that you're not building a strong man to knock down, yep. then, then you know you've got a strong position. Yep. You're saying weak inversion is what you should do at that, right? And, yep. so, and I understand why in the actual disease case, because you don't want them to get sick, mm -hmm. but if you're preparing somebody for potential argument, why wouldn't you want to give them the tools to, even if you have to build up to it, yeah. the strongest possible Yeah. Case. I'm really glad you asked that. There's a big difference between weakened and weak. Right? So weakened simply means that it's a counterargument that's been refuted, no matter the strength of that, of that counterargument. It could be the absolutely strongest counterargument possible, as long as it's weakened, <laughs> not weak. Um, that's my really good answer and my really bad answer, but it's the one that's based on data, is that uh, it actually doesn't matter in terms of measuring attitude change that I can actually bring, uh, this hasn't been tested a lot, only two studies that I can think of, um, that I can actually bring up horrible counter-arguments, ridiculous ones, and refute them and still inoculate. And that was a sad thing to find, right? <laughs> uh, that, was the, that was the predatory credit card marketing study, that one of the conditions was ridiculous counter-argument, really strong refutation, it still worked. That's unfortunate. Well, my question is, has anyone ever counted inoculation just on like cable news? Like, I mean, I, I feel like inoculation is everywhere. I, I was uh, working out the gym uh, two days ago or something. That was Fox News was on. And I mean, they had some story about like uh, the city, the, the mayor of London wants to ban knives. You know, and it's, it, I mean, it's clearly an inoculation message against uh, for that uh, particular position and kind of thing like that. Yeah. And, yeah. If you're look, looking at conventional inoculation, prof, prophylactic, I think the ingredients for inoculation are always there and always everywhere. But it's only inoculation if the timing's right. So you have a position, it is challenged by a two-sided message, and then you encounter stronger messages later. Right. Timing's really important for conventional inoculation to take, to take place. But you don't know if anybody has it actually. Any no. Uh, so this feels like a pretty obvious question, but on that sort of hopeful note that ended on, yeah. um, that inoculation encourages people to engage in dialogue and hopefully the truth will yeah. rise. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, doesn't inoculation, it falls on the wrong hand, doesn't it make one resistant to evidence and reasons? Mm -hmm. and, and if not, if we do get the hopeful story that we want to tell, then to what extent were they really inoculated? Yeah, that's a really good question. A conventional inoculation treatment message uh, is, you're right, is not based on evidence reasoning. It's based on uh, some sort of robust process that's triggered by considering counterarguments and refutations. We know that it generates more thoughts. We've, we've quantified them. Uh, we know that it generates stronger arguments. We've qualitatively assessed them. Um, but we don't know if it's teaching them how to actually reason, how to actually use evidence. But the most recent inoculation research is doing that. It's doing a counterargument, a refutation, and why. So John Cook at George Mason, who's doing the climate change research, is saying, here's something that you'll encounter about inoculation, I mean, uh, about, about climate change. Um, uh, here's why it's wrong on an evidentiary level. Here's the reasoning fallacy here. And they found some early results to suggest that it's actually teaching them how to think better, to think more critically. It's nascent stages of this of this research, but pretty promising. So we'll see. To be continued. Question. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm just wondering, uh, would you agree then, as a conclusion, that uh, the best way to deal with uh, fake news is not to censor anything? Um, but to just uh, give people the resources to refute the false information. So to give them the, the knowledge and the arguments to recognize that it is false. I wanted so badly to end on, end on that hopeful note of dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> but I got nervous when you started to push me on it. <laughs> and now I have no choice. Uh, yeah, I think ideally, though, <laughs> it's, it's too late. For inoculation, because that it's a it's a preventative. It is a it is a, a a preemptive, preparing for the onslaught. That we needed we needed to play better um, offense uh, with it. Um, 
so, so maybe start now so that we can protect against tomorrow's fake news, right? Um, but there are other methods to help probably dig through some of the reasoning fallacies and, and uh, evidence issues that then inoculation can supplement that to then lock in. Uh, you did say it could also be therapeutic. Yeah, well, there's, there's limited research to suggest. There's 50 years of research to show that it can be prophylactic. It's really, really strong. And there's three studies that show that uh, it can be therapeutic, and they're all in the lab. Right? It's actually just like medical therapeutic inoculations. Doctors, medical researchers would love to find therapeutic vac vaccinations that would cure the disease you have and then protect you from getting that again. Um, the doctors that I've interviewed, when I've tried to draw some parallels here, tell me that yes, that's still the ideal, but it doesn't work very well outside of their laboratory settings. So if you have a choice, as one doctor said, Prophylactics always better than therapeutic. Get it before it actually it actually settles settles in. Like real medicine. Like real medicine. Yeah.